So, assalamu alaikum and good evening, everybody, and thank you for uh, joining us tonight for uh, LACIV lecture series number 13 from Oman Diabetic Association. These lecture series are aimed to provide healthcare professionals taking care about diabetic patients, improving their knowledge, skill, and inshallah to be reflected on the patient care. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Farsad Fathi. Dr. Farsad is consultant uh, neurologist in Khula Hospital. And inshallah, he will speak about diabetic neuropathy. Dr. Farsad, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to speak to our participant. And I'm sure they will, uh, uh, I mean, they will be happy listening to you about this um, important topic. So thank you very much again for being with us. And usually uh, this one take around 40 to 45 minutes and uh, everybody will come to ask question in the Q&A section. Or if they would like to ask a verbal question, you can raise your hand and uh, Saud kindly will allow them to, to speak directly to you. So thank you very much and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. Good evening, colleagues. Salamun alaikum. Uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, Oman Medical, uh, Oman Diabetic Association for my invitation and it's my pleasure to be here and I hope that this lecture could be useful for my colleagues, primary health care and it could be, as Dr. Ahmad said, it could be reflected in usual practice. Uh, my talk is about diabetic polyneuropathy. Uh, the goals of my presentation is to list the common system that are involved by diabetes, then list the sensory symptoms, motor symptoms, autonomic symptoms, common types of diabetic polyneuropathy, and the main medications that we usually use to treat the patients. Uh, first of all, I start with the epidemiology of diabetes. As you know, may better uh, you know better than me, uh, diabetes mellitus is a major health problem globally aligned with other health problems such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, smoking, and other uh, health concerns. Diabetes is one of the most important concerns, especially for primary health care. And it's estimated that global prevalence of diabetes is around 10%. It depends on the region in the uh, uh, geographical area. And it's expected the number of diabetic patients is increasing in future, and uh, we will have a, a rise in the number of patients in future. Uh, regarding Oman, as I search, uh, I believe that the best published article uh, that was published in 2015, and uh, it was uh, estimated that it age adjusted prevalence of type 2 diabetes in Oman in 2015 was around 10 to 20 percent and especially the highest prevalence of imperfasting glucose was in males around 35 percent that's absolutely a high number and uh, it's estimated that number of undiagnosed type 2 diabetes is much more and it would be higher than 25 percent and according to the prediction in this manuscript, it was predicted that in 2050, we would have around 350,000 people with type 2 diabetes, and it could be increased in around uh, 20 years later to uh, more than 1.7 times in comparison with today. Therefore, diabetes would be a major concern in future, and also it's a concern now, but you know, it's not only the diabetes or glycemic controls. When you have uh, raising the number of diabetic patients, you would have num raising the number of complications and sometimes managing complications is more difficult and more important than diabetes itself. Uh, therefore, uh, as the type two diabetes is increasing, and in next three decades, we will have an epidemic of diabetes. And it's estimated that it could consume around one third of national health expenditure. Therefore, 
is required to be ready for an epidemic of diabetes and its complication and the uh, major sources that we need to uh, treat the patients and also manage the patients. You know better than me that diabetes uh, can attack any system, including central nervous system. It can cause brain stroke. It can cause cerebrovascular disease, any cerebrovascular disease. And it can also uh, be a major cause of cardiovascular disease, such as myocardial infection, ischemic heart disease. It can be a main reason for diabetic nephropathy or kidney disease, diabetic neuropathy. That's uh, the main topic of today. Also, it, it can involve eye causing cataract, glaucoma, uh, dental disease, peripheral vascular disease, foot ulcer, and any other complication. Therefore, when a patient faces with diabetes after some years, or even at the beginning, uh, we may expect the complications and we should be able to manage the complications. Uh, one of the major complications of diabetes is peripheral neuropathy, but before uh, specifically explaining about the peripheral neuro uh, diabetic neuropathy, I explain a little bit about the peripheral neuropathy. Uh, peripheral neuropathy is one of the most complications of diabetes and the prevalence of peripheral neuropathy not because of diabetes, because of the total causes in different studies has been uh, estimated between 6 to 50 percent, depending on the age, duration of diabetes, glucose control, type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. Therefore, you see a variation in, uh, in the percent of diabetes prevalence between the different studies, but in overall, it's estimated that around half of the patients may develop uh, diabetic neuropathy at the end of 25 years. Therefore, we should always uh, wait about the, uh, the complication, the neuropathy, and uh, we should be able to manage the complication. As you know, uh, we have two types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes mellitus. The difference between type 1 and type 2 is that usually because type 1 diabetes mellitus is diagnosed sooner than absolutely type 2 because of the symptoms uh, usually start at earlier age and uh, it's usually diagnosed sooner. Therefore, uh, insulin treatment is usually started at the start of disease. Therefore, peripheral neuropathy usually happens after many years. But the problem for type 2 diabetes mellitus is that in many patients or many subjects, it's underdiagnosed or undiagnosed. And therefore, when you face a patient with a uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus, it could be started many years ago, for example, 10 years, 5 years, or 2 years ago. And therefore, uh, when uh, some patients even present with peripheral neuropathy as a manifestation of diabetes type 2, and when we do the routine in investigations for detecting the cause of the uh, neuropathy, we may find uh, and underdiagnosed or undiagnosed diabetes. Therefore, usually uh, in type two diabetes, uh, peripheral neuropathy presents sooner than type one. And patients, as I said before, this patient already may have neuropathy at the time of diagnosis. Uh, but what's the term of peripheral polyneuropathy or neuropathy? As you know, uh, the neuropathy is you have when you have pathology in the nerve. It could be uh, peripheral or central. But when we say neuropathy or peripheral neuropathy, we mean the peripheral neuropathy, the nerves that start after the anterior horn cell uh, in a spinal cord. And uh, if uh, you see here, that's the uh, soma or cell body of the nerve, that's the axon, that's the myelin that covers the axon. If uh, with any cause or with any reason you have damage to myelin or axon is called neuropathy. And here is a healthy neuron and it's a damaged neuron because of the myelin is attacked by something maybe toxic or any etiology and you have neuropathy. And as you know, the role of myelin is for uh, saltatory propagation of impulses or electricity uh, within the axon. But if you have damage to the axon or myelin, the nerve 
conduction velocity decreases and therefore the signals from the uh, cell body uh, faces a delay to reach to the nerve ending and also to the muscle and therefore you may have according the uh, nerve involved it could be sensory symptoms it could be motor symptoms and uh, when uh, you see here there are too many etiologies for peripheral neuropathies it could be infectious infectious uh, such as for example lyme or uh, diphtheria or any other infection it could be toxic due to illicit drugs or agricultural toxins it could be autoimmune for example in patients with sugar and disease or uh, systemic lupus erythromatosis you may encounter with uh, peripheral neuropathy in vasculitis or vasculitic neuropathy that could be also autoimmune and also in metabolic or nutritive nutritional neuropathy such as B12 deficiency, vitamin E deficiency or copper deficiency, you could have neuropathy and it could be also hereditary, uh, for example, in Charcot-Marie-Tooth disorder or other kinds of uh, hereditary neuropathies, you can have neuropathy symptoms. But uh, one of the most important causes of uh, polyneuropathy is uh, diabetes mellitus and poor glycemic control. For the diabetic neuropathy, the clinical manifestations are categorized in uh, three uh, categories. It could be sensory, it could be motor manifestation, it could be autonomic manifestations. Sometimes they present together or uh, they may present, for example, motor symptoms may present sooner or sensory symptoms may be present sooner and usually uh, uh, they may not present simultaneously. Uh, for sensory symptoms, usually in diabetic neuropathy, sensory symptoms are more prevalent than motor symptoms, and usually they are the initial uh, symptoms. They usually uh, the onset is usually insidious, and the the at the start the presentation is very mild, but after a while it increases in the severity and intensity, and gradually it increases. Usually it follows a glove stacking pattern, as you see in the figure at the right side at the picture. Uh, glove stacking means that when you have, for example, the sensory symptom from knee to the below, that's, that's the part of uh, stacking. Uh, you have a problem in your hand below the wrist from uh, the wrist to the fingertips, and it's called a glove stacking pattern that's very frequent in many uh, neuropathies, such as diabetic neuropathy, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, CIDP, or other kinds of polyneuropathy. The symptoms could be negative or positive that I, I will explain in details. They could be diffuse or focal. Usually in uh, diabetic polyneuropathy, it's diffuse and it usually uh, involves the distal parts of the limbs, but also it could be focal and uh, in diabetes, uh, you can find any kind of neuropathy. Uh, as I said, the symptoms could be negative or positive. Negative means you have loss of sensation. Uh, the patient may explain as a feeling of numbness or deadness. The patient explains that uh, it's like that I have not my hand or I have not my foot. I do not feel anything when I walk or for example, and uh, when I walk on the carpet, I do not feel anything. Uh, it, it, it seems that it, the patient explains that it seems that I have uh, put on, for example, gloves or stacks. I uh, sorry, socks. I do not feel uh, the carpet or ground very, uh, well, the patient may explain as loss of balance, disequilibrium, especially when, when the patient uh, is in dark area or in dark environment, the patient may fall. The symptoms also could be positive symptoms such as burning, prickling, tingling, or electric shock-like feelings. The, the patient may explain as tightness or sometimes uh, the patient could explain it as hyperalgesia or hypersensitivity to touch. Therefore, any sensory symptoms could be seen in diabetic neuropathy. After the uh, sensory symptoms, usually uh, after some years, motor symptoms happen. The motor symptoms uh, usually uh, present in distal parts, in hands and in feet. In upper extremities, the patient explained 
as impaired fine hand coordination and difficulty in doing tasks with hands such as buttony, opening jaws or turning keys. And in lower extremities, the patient usually uh, complains of problem in putting on the shoes or foot slapping or frequent tripping. Also the patient in advanced diabetic polyneuropathy may uh, present with proximal muscle weakness. It's less usual, less usual, but it happens. For example, the patient may uh, describe as difficulty in climbing up or down stairs, difficulty getting up from a sitting or supine position or uh, falls due to uh, giving the way that happens during the walking. Therefore, uh, motor symptoms may happen usually after that sensory symptoms. There is some years between uh, sensory symptoms and motor symptoms. And uh, sometimes the motor symptoms and the weakness could be disabling for the patient. Also, the patient may present with autonomic symptoms. The autonomic symptoms are usually uh, underdiagnosed because in routine examinations, uh, we, may not, we may not ask the patient about autonomic symptoms. Autonomic, autonomic symptoms could be uh, cardiovascular, could be gastrointestinal, genital urinary, or uh, it could be due to involvement of sweet glands. Uh, for gastrointestinal symptoms, they are absolutely frequent in diabetic polyneuropathy and diabetic patients. The patient may explain the symptoms as dysphagia or abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, or malabsorption, diarrhea, or constipation. That's because of the problem that happens in uh, autonomic nervous system of uh, gastrointestinal system. Also with cardiovascular uh, autonomic neuropathy, the patient may have uh, persistent sinus tachycardia. The patient may present with palpitation, also orthostatic hypotension. Uh, the patient may say that when the patient stands up, uh, he or she feels like dizziness or giddiness, and also sinus arrhythmia or near syncope uh, may happen uh, with changing the position in diabetic polyneuropathy. Also, urinary problems are frequent in patients with diabetic polyneuropathy. Uh, it could be uh, uh, like frequency, urgency, poor urinary stream, and uh, feeling of incomplete bladder. And you know, sometimes the management of bladder neuropathy is very difficult. Uh, you may put the patient on uh, medications, but sometimes you cannot control the symptoms. And also the patient uh, may present with pseudomotor neuropathy. Pseudomotor means the problem in uh, sweet glands. Therefore the patient complain of heat intolerance and also heavy sweating or hyperhidrosis. Usually the hyperhidrosis happens in head and neck and trunk with uh, loss of sweating in lower trunk and extremities. When the patient with his history of diabetes mellitus present with motor symptoms, sensory symptoms, and also autonomic symptoms, for the confirmation, you need to do physical examination. Uh, for physical examination, usually, uh, we do the assessment for peripheral nerve involvement and also autonomic uh, nervous system involvement. Uh, you usually start with motor examination and sensory examination. For sensory examination, we, knew, we need to check for uh, assessment of gross light touch and also pinprick sensation. We should uh, start from distal parts to the proximal parts because I, as I said before, usually distal parts are involved more than proximal parts. And when you do pinprick from distal part and coming to proximal parts, the sensation usually increases. In distal parts, the patient may not uh, completely feel uh, the pinprick, but when you come to the proximal parts, the patient usually feel it. And with the advance, advance of diabetes and with uh, increasing the duration of diabetes, usually the uh, level of uh, insensitivity to pinprick usually increase. Uh, also, uh, another sensory examination, import ex examination is uh, doing vibration and proprioception. Uh, it's not usual to do uh, vibration tests in, in peripheral uh, diabetic neuropathy, but it's very important because it could be an early finding. We do, uh, we usually use the diapason 
uh, over the toes and also the fingertips for the sensation of vibration. As the disease progress, uh, progresses, the level of decreased sensation may move off or into the legs and from the hands into the arms. And the pattern as uh, I described before are as glove stacking or stacking and glove pattern. This is the diapason or tuning fork that we use for uh, vibration or proprioception. Usually we use the uh, diapason with frequency of 128 hertz. It's the best uh, frequency for che uh, checking the uh, vibration. And uh, usually it's an early finding for diabetic polyneuropathy that uh, the vibration sensation is decreased. For, uh, also for peripheral neuropathy testing and for motor examination, you should do uh, cranial nerve testing from, usually we do from cranial nerve two, optic nerve to cranial nerve 12. And also for motor examination, it's mandated, mandatory to perform strength testing for both distal and proximal muscles. And uh, for deep tendon reflexes, we use the hammers and usually in patients with peripheral neuropathy, especially diabetic neuropathy, the deep tendon reflexes decrease. And for the gait, uh, we, uh, we should want the patient to uh, walk on heel and uh, on toes. And the patient usually with motor symptoms present with a uh, problem for walking on toes or on heels. And also the slapping gait or drop gait may happen. Uh, for autonomic testing, it's not difficult to test for the patient. You can check the pulse rate and also blood pressure uh, when the patient is in supine position. And after that, checking again at sitting and also stand, standing. If there was any evidence of orthostatic hypotension, it's, it's in favor of a kind of autonomic neuropathy. Uh, for the classification of diabetic neuropathy, uh, the most prevalent kind of diabetic neuropathy is sensory neuropathy that usually involves distal parts of the extremities, but uh, usually the symptoms are symmetrical and generalized, but we have also sensory motor neuropathy. As I said, usually motor uh, symptoms uh, manifest after some years after that sensory symptoms. Also, we have autonomic neuropathy. It could be mostly cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, genitourinary, or pseudomotor, but it's not usual as uh, symmetrical polyneuropathies or generalized symmetrical polyneuropathies, but focal or multifocal neuropathies may happen. For example, for cranial neuropathy, uh, the patient may present with six nerve palsy or third nerve palsy, or for example, with seventh or facial nerve palsy, like what happens in Bell's palsy. Uh, also, uh, an unusual presentation is proximal motor neuropathy or amyotrophy or uh, uh, diabetic amyotrophy. That's, uh, that's not usual, but it may happen, especially in patients with uh, poor controlled glucose or hyperglycemic in patients with hyperglycemic state. Also, the patient may present with thoracic and lumbar radiculopathies, focal limb neuropathies, such as entrapment neuropathy, the patients may present with carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar neuropathy, or any other kind of focal neuropathy. And sometimes uh, the syndrome of CIDP or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy may superimpose on diabetic neuropathy. Uh, uh, it's not uh, determined whether this is a cause and effect relation or is uh, an incidental uh, manifestation, but it may happen. And it's important to diagnose CIDP with, uh, when it happens with diabetes because it's more treatable. You can use IVIG or plasma exchange to treat the patient, patients with CIDP and diabetes. In this figure, uh, some kinds of prevalent diabetic polyneuropathies Sean, for example, the most prevalent kind is uh, the figure that's labeled with letter A. As you see, the most prevalent is the distal, symmetrical, generalized sensory motor polyneuropathy. But as you see in figure B, you may have a focal neuropathy and also in figure C and in figure D that shows the autonomic neuropathy. 
Uh, as I explained, most common manifestation is multiple nerves, uh, diffuse involvement, and it's called symmetrical uh, or generalized symmetrical polyneuropathy that, as you see here, it involves distal parts of the body. Uh, the severity and pattern of polyneuropathy depends on the duration of the uh, diabetes. If uh, the duration increases, the possibility of polyneuropathy increases, and also the severity and intensity of polyneuropathy increases. And if the diabetes was poor control because of the uh, at, uh, patient's adherence to the medication was not good or for any other reason, the severity and intensity of polyneuropathy uh, may be worse. And uh, also another pattern in diabetic polyneuropathy is lens dependent neuropathy. It means that usually the longest nerves are affected first. For example, in lower limbs, <clears throat> sciatic nerve and uh, the continuing, continuing nerves such as common pronal or tibial nerves are more involved than proximal nerves such as uh, femoral neuropathy. Another common type of polyneuropathy in diabetic patient is small fiber neuropathy. It's different from uh, large fiber neuropathies. Small fiber neuropathies means that when you have involvement of small fibers, uh, as you know, uh, we have uh, many types of nerve fibers such as A delta, A, and also C. For small fibers, when uh, the nerve endings are involved, we call it small fiber neuropathy. Uh, usually the patient present with tingling distal paresthesia. And uh, as I said, usually uh, the nerves with A delta or C fibers are more involved. Uh, it could be very difficult uh, for the uh, electrodiagnostic, uh, electrodiagnostic study because in such form of neuropathy, usually the edX or electrodiagnostic study is normal. But in large fiber neuropathy, you can uh, uh, find something in nerve conduction study. Uh, as I explained, we have asymmetrical neuropathy such as, such as median, median neuropathy mimicking carpal tunnel syndrome, thoracic radicular uh, neuropathy, lombosacral radicular plexopathy. And uh, for cranial neuropathy, uh, usually uh, the most common uh, cranial nerves that are involved are cranial nerves six, three, four, seven, or two. Uh, and uh, one important presentation, for example, for uh, involving the cranial nerve tree is that there is pupil sparing. Uh, as you know, the cranial nerve tree are, uh, also innervates pupils, but usually in third nerve uh, cranial neuropathy that happens in patients with diabetes, pupils are spared and we usually, we, usually we use it to differentiate it uh, from other uh, reasons for the uh, third nerve palsy, such as uh, posterior communicating RC aneurysm. Uh, facial neuropathy, like what happens in Bell's palsy, also can happen in patients with diabetic neuropathy. It could be acute or subacute. And uh, usually, most patients recover spontaneously in three to six months. One of important uh, and disabling manifestation of uh, cranial neuropathy in diabetic patient is anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. It's uh, absolutely a uh, vascular event. Uh, it's like that you have a stroke in optic nerve, but usually in optic nerve head. Therefore, the patient may uh, develop with acute visual loss. Usually uh, it uh, causes the inferior attitudinal field of the patient. And also if you do fondoscopy for the patient, you see that the optic is, is pale and swollen. And also less common uh, manifestations include diabetic radiculoplexus neuropathy or diabetic amyotrophy. The most frequent initial symptom this, in this rare syndrome is sudden severe unilateral pain in hip or lower back or shoulder or neck. And after that, uh, acute or subacute weakness happens after the pain. And uh, if untreated, it can cause atrophy of limb musculature in lower or upper limbs. About the diagnosing uh, diabetic polyneuropathy, usually you should follow this algorithm. First of all, history taking is very important about the, how the diabetes is controlled, 
is the patient uh, adherent to the medication? Is it uh, is the glycemic control uh, good or uh, bad control? After that, you should do uh, neurological examination, including sensory motor examination. You should uh, watch the gait of the patient and also uh, doing uh, uh, checking for deep tendon reflexes. And after that, uh, if you are convinced that the patient suffers from a kind of uh, diabetic polyneuropathy, for the confirmation, usually we uh, request for electrodiagnostic study. And after that, the def definite diagnosis is made. For electrodiagnostic study, we use EMG machine or electromyography machines. Uh, as you see here, uh, you use uh, the recording electrodes and also a stimulus that's uh, electrical shock to the nerve. And after that, we record from uh, the electrodes. You have the waves that, uh, according to parameters, for example, amplitude, duration, or uh, velocity, you can uh, define the kind of neuropathy. Is it demyelinating or axonal or also define the severity of neuropathy. Is it a severe polyneuropathy? Is it focal or multifocal or generalized neuropathy? Therefore, with the assistance of electrodiagnostic study, you can confirm the clinical diagnosis, as exclude other neuropathy mimics, such as radiculopathy or distal myopathy. And also sometimes you can reveal subclinical involvement of clinically unaffected nerve, because sometimes the patient, for example, complaints of distal paresthesia in legs, but when you do electrodiagnostic study, you notice that upper limbs are also involved. And therefore, you can have a view of the extent of polyneuropathy. And also you can define the uh, accurate uh, mechanism of the damage. Is it axonal or demyelinating? It's significant that in patients with diabetic polyneuropathy, we have axonal type of uh, polyneuropathy. The myelinating neuropathy is usually seen in other uh, syndromes such as uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome or CIDP, and also determine the disease severity and also intensity. Regarding the diabetic neuropathy treatment, uh, as uh, the, that's the usual phrase or the well-known phrase that the most important treatment is prevention. Therefore, it's important to explain for the patient at the start of diabetes diagnosis that uh, good glycemic control is very important. It can prevent the complications because sometimes when the complication is happened, managing the complication could be very difficult. And especially for the neuropathy, sometimes the symptoms could be severe and uh, they may not sometimes uh, uh, very well uh, responding to the treatment. It's important diabetic neuropathy has no known cure. Therefore, you can only control the symptoms. The goals of treatment include uh, uh, a slow progression or reducing the progression of diabetic neuropathy, relieving the patient's symptoms. That most important symptom is pain, but other symptoms such as autonomic dysfunction or other symptoms and also manage complications and restoring the function. The extended progression of the disease is important to keeping the blood sugar within target range. And uh, we should explain for the patient that the most important treatment for the patient is good glycemic control again. The medications that we use for, the, for relieving pain, they are only symptomatic treatment. They are not cure. And, your treatment is to prevent for further progression. And uh, it's essential to prevent or delay nerve damage with uh, good blood sugar control. But for symptomatic management, because sometimes the pain and paresthesia are disabling for the patient and we should re uh, relieve the pain, we have uh, some medications in different categories of medications. For example, anti-seizure medications or anti-epileptic medications, antidepressant medication, and also serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or SNRIs. For uh, anti-seizure medications, we, we usually use pregabalin and gabapentin. They are uh, absolutely effective, especially at the start of disease to reduce the uh, symptoms. But uh, uh, there are some side effects 
they may cause drowsiness, dizziness, and uh, sometimes swelling in patients. Uh, regarding the antidepressant, we have different kinds of antidepressants, such as specific antidepressants, such as amitriptyline, desipramine, nortriptyline, or imipramine. And side effects can be sometimes uh, bothersome, such as dry mouth or drowsiness. And uh, one category of the medication that uh, are more effective than anti uh, usual antidepressant includes serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or SNRI, such as doloxetine or Cymbalta or uh, Velofaxin, but possible side effects include nausea, sleepiness, dizziness, and decreased appetite. Therefore, it's important for uh, starting the medication, we should use the with the lowest possible medication, and after that, escalate the dose to prevent the side effects such as drowsiness. Also, it's possible to use uh, OTC medications such as painkillers, such as astomnofen, burufen, and uh, some use a skin patch with lidocaine, especially for sores or for hands. And sometimes we use the combination of medication. For example, we use pregabalin with amitriptyline or amitriptyline with, uh, for example, a venlafaxine or duloxetine. And uh, we should manage the patient with changing the medication, increasing the dose, changing the, uh, changing the medication or uh, adding some medication for reducing the side effects. Uh, but it's not usually the pain that bothers the patient. We have uh, other symptoms such as autonomic symptoms, such as digestive problems. For example, for digestive problems, uh, we should advise the patient to eating a smaller, more frequent meals to, uh, and diet change is important. Uh, the patient should use the diet with more fibers. Uh, and also for orthostatic hypotension may uh, we may advise the patient for drinking plenty of water and also changing positions such as sitting or standing very slowly, not fast uh, changing in position. And uh, uh, also uh, sleeping with the head of bed raised around six to 10 inches may prevent swings in blood pressure at night. And if the uh, autonomic disability or instability was very severe, we may use other medications such as midodri. Therefore, it's the last slide because uh, it's just uh, 14 minutes. Uh, for the take-home message, peripheral neuropathy is one of the most common complication of, complications of diabetes. Its management requires a multidisciplinary approach. We need uh, primary health care. We need uh, endocrinologists, we need neurologists, they should work together to uh, relieve the patient's symptoms and also prevent the, most importantly, prevent the symptoms. Regular screening for diabetes, mellitus polyneuropathy and complications is essential. The poly polyneuropathy may involve motor, sensory, or autonomic systems. The most common type is a symmetrical lens dependent sensory neuropathy and after that sensory motor polyneuropathy. And the most important treatment again is prevention after uh, the, the occurrence of polyneuropathy sometimes it's, it's very difficult to manage the patient consistently keeping blood sugar within target range is the essential preventing uh, treatment or therapy for the patient for delaying nerve damage a combination of antidepressant um, anti-epileptic medications and otc usually is used, uh, are used for treating the patients and uh, also treating complications require, requires a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, it was the last slide. I hope that this presentation has been useful for you. And if there is any question, I am ready to answer. Thank you very much, Dr. Farsad, for this uh, comprehensive uh, review for the diabetic neuropathy. And I cannot stress more on the importance of prevention, especially at the level of primary health care. Yes. Uh, prevention is the primary target. As you said, uh, diabetes is a very devastating uh, disease. It is not, not the neurology, it's the kidney, it's the eye, it's the heart, yes. everywhere. So I think prevention is the first, uh, I mean, the, the first 
primary treatment. prevention. Yeah, the first treatment, as you said, yeah. yes. And then, but in case these complications do happen, that we, ne we need to be ready to manage them, as you mentioned uh, clearly. So we'll take some question. So let's see if you have verbal question, please use you, you, uh, your hand in the, the hand sign, and we will give you the, um, the mic to talk. Uh, otherwise, we will take uh, some written questions. So let's start with um, Ikrami, Ikrami Saeed, or Sayed. Saeed, if you can open for uh, Ikrami. Okay, uh, may I read a question for the written question? Now he will speak, Dr. Ikrami. Oh, I see. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. Okay, Assalamu alaikum, Doctor. Alaikum salam. Uh, thanks for the interesting lecture. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Yes. Uh, the first one is some patients continue to have sensory uh, uh, neuropathy in the form of uh, uh, pain in uh, hands and feet. Uh, you know that uh, stock and the gloves distribution, despite yeah. a very good glycemic control, how to manage these patients. And the second question, you mentioned some medications in order to relieve the pain. Can you tell us which is more superior, the anti-epileptic uh, or the uh, antidepressant, tricyclic antidepressants or the SNRI? And thanks, doctor. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, as you know better than me, even with good glycemic control after years, uh, even uh, with the blood sugar was in the target, it's possible to happen the complications such as not only polyneuropathy, but also, for example, uh, retinopathy, kidney disease. And therefore, even with uh, good glycemic control, it's possible to have uh, complications and symptoms such as tingling and paresthesia. Therefore, when the patient presents with uh, these symptoms and the, the, the blood sugar is well controlled, it's, uh, it's mandatory to start the medications. Regarding the medications, if the paresthesia and tingling was the major symptom or the positive symptoms were the major symptoms, it's better to start uh, antidepressants or SNRIs. Uh, usually the SNRIs or serotonin nor epinephrine reuptake inhibitors are uh, more potent than uh, usual uh, uh, antidepressant or tricyclic antidepressant than omitriptyline and usually the side effects are less than. Therefore, uh, for my preference is to start, for example, if, one, if I want to manage, for example, paresthesia or tingly, I usually start with duloxetine or Cymbalta. But if it was not available, the next option is tricyclic antidepressants, usually amitriptyline or imipramine or nortriptyline. In uh, TCA's, amitriptyline is more potent than nortriptyline or for example, for, uh, than imi, imipramine uh, in terms of uh, neuropathy management and uh, the sensory management reducing the tingling or paresthesia, but the major side effect is drowsiness, and therefore uh, it's mandatory to uh, start the medication with uh, lowest possible dose. For example, if you start, for example, omitriptyline 25 milligrams, we should you, uh, we should start it at a dose of 12.5 milligram, and after one week or 10 days, we should escalate the dose and increase it to 25 or 50 or more to manage the symptoms. Uh, for negative symptoms, or for example, for uh, some symptoms such as electrical or shock-like symptoms, usually gabapentin or pregabalin is preferred than TCA. But uh, in severe symptoms, usually you use a combination. For example, you use uh, gabapentin aligned with amitriptyline, gabapentin aligned with uh, SNRI, and it depends uh, on the, absolutely on the duration of the disease. Uh, at the start of the neuropathy, uh, at the start of tingling, the patient may respond very well, for example, even with uh, amitriptyline half a tablet, but after one year, two years, uh, the symptoms may be re resistant to the, uh, for example, the dose, and you should increase and escalate the dose, and after that, uh, you should use the combination therapy. Therefore, each patient should be managed case by case uh, for, uh, for following the patient and also for symptom management. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. So let's take maybe some questions from the Q&A section. 
So, Sister Khadija say, how frequently should diabetic patients do neurological assessment, especially for diabetic more than 15 years or more? Uh, it's important at least once per year or uh, in every session that patient, usually the diabetic patients are followed, for example, for six months or one year. And each session is mandatory to ask about the uh, symptoms, especially sensory symptoms. If uh, we do a simple neurological examination or even simple neurological questions, for example, do you have any paresthesia? Do you have any tingling? Or uh, do you have any problem uh, when walking? Or for example, going up stairs? Uh, if the uh, answer was yes, therefore you should go for uh, more detailed examination. Uh, and uh, because it takes around one or two minutes to do a rapid neurological examination for diabetic neuropathy, for checking for sensory or for motor, it takes uh, less than two minutes. Therefore, it's better to do it at least annually for the uh, symptoms. And if the patient had developed any symptom, you should uh, advise for further evaluation for electrodiagnostic study or any other uh, study that's required. Excellent. Some similar question. How sensitive monofilament test and vibration test in detecting early neuropathy? Uh, I cannot give you exact number, but it's usually more sensitive than, uh, uh, for example, pin prick testing. And even vibration could be impaired sooner than the patient's symptoms. Therefore, if, for example, the patient has uh, the diabetes mellitus for more than 15 years or 10 years, and the patient has no symptom, there is no uh, chief complaint, it's better to do vibration for the patient because if the vibration has increased, it's in, the fa it's in favor of a starting a neuropathy without any symptom or asymptomatic neuropathy. Okay, excellent. The next question, dose of gabapentin and amit uh, amitriptyline. As you know, the least dose for gabapentin is 100 milligram because it's in capsule. Therefore, it's better to start with gabapentin 100 milligrams. And after that, you should follow the patient. And uh, some patients are maybe controlled with even 100 milligrams. And after that, escalate the dose very gradually. Uh, you can increase gabapentin from 100 to 300, 900, and even to 3,600 milligram per day if the patient tolerates. Uh, the patient tolerates, uh, but it should be increased very gradually. Pregabalin is more potent than gabapentin. Uh, you should uh, start it with the dose of 75 milligrams at night, and after that, uh, gradually increase for the best symptom control. For amitriptyline, as I said before, we usually uh, start it with half a tablet, usually uh, for 12.5 uh, milligrams at night, usually I started for uh, seven days or 10 days, and after that, uh, uh, escalate the dose for one month, re-evaluate re the patient. If the patient uh, was in, uh, was uh, uh, the patient's symptoms had, co had been controlled, uh, I may continue the same dose. I try to use the least dose possible because of the side effects and other interactions that may happen with other medications. Excellent. So you listed the options of medication. Are they in order? Uh, usually, uh, we start with tricyclic antidepressant. If SNRI was available, my preference is SNRI, such as duloxetine or venlafaxine. If the patient didn't respond, after that, I add gabapentin or pregabalin, and sometimes uh, uh, combination therapy. Excellent. Any rule for B, B6 and B12 in the prevention? Uh, there are many articles about the role of vitamins, especially group B for uh, thiamine, for pridoxin, and also for B12. Uh, usually we prescribe for any kind of neuropathy we use, uh, especially thiamine. Uh, uh, there is no definite uh, role, you know, there is no approved role for these vitamins, but you can start for the patient. I usually start with thiamine uh, with a dose of 300 milligrams per day. Excellent. Is um, uh, the amitriptyline contraindicated in glaucoma? 
in some in some types of glaucoma, glaucoma it could be contraindicated. We should have ophthalmology consultation before starting tricyclic antidepressants. Uh, the other question: If the diabetic control is excellent, will still patient have uh, neuropathy? I think already covered this one. That's this yes, yes. But any explanation why if, if the control is good, why the patient developed complication? Because it's not glucose. There are other mechanisms other than glucose control. Mm -hmm. uh, the glucose may be controlled very well, but other complications such as the retinopathy or even kidney disease or neuropathy may happen. And uh, But with good control, the, you have a delay for uh, symptom uh, occurrence. For example, other than, uh, other than 10 years, you would have the symptoms after 25 years or 30 years. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not... Uh, uh, is you cannot promise the patient if you do glycemic control very well you you will not have for example diabetic neuropathy it may happen but after uh, a protracted time after 20 years 25 years or 30 years yeah and uh, most of these medication cause uh, drowsiness so is there any concern of or precaution in using them in elderly yes absolutely you should talk about to the patient, to the patient and also the accompanying person, uh, to the son or daughter. And because if, especially if you start with higher doses, for example, higher doses of uh, omitriptyline or galpentine, uh, especially in the elderly, the patient may fall, uh, you may have some fractures. Therefore, it's mandatory to start with the least possible dose and after that, increase it very gradually. We are not in a rush for uh, increasing the dose because the patient health is more important. Uh, for example, preventing the fracture or like that is more important than paresthesia. Therefore, you should explain it to the patient and also accompanying person and uh, about the risk and also the warnings that may uh, happen after starting these medications. So after starting small dose and if patient is still symptomatic, should we increase the dose or combine another drug? It's better to do monotherapy because, you know, uh, the diabetic patient usually use other medication for hypertension, for ischemic heart disease, for diabetes. Therefore, if you use two medications or three medications, there would be some inter interactions between medication and it would be more difficult for patient to manage the medications. Therefore, it's better to control with one medication and escalate the dose to the maximum dose, if not the symptoms control, adding other medication. Excellent. So we have a very big question from Humam. Humam, please go ahead. Humam Fatari. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Farzad, uh, for the very informative uh, presentation. But thank actually, do statins may reduce the risk of uh, neuropathy as a result of uh, lipid lowering or anti-inflammatory effects? Is there any role, please? Thank you so much. Uh, it may be, I'm not sure. I have not a definite answer right now, but maybe I'm not sure because uh, a certain reduced uh, the risk of cerebrovascular accidents, cerebrovascular disorders, and also, uh, especially in vasculitic neuropathy, they may reduce the risk of vasculitic neuropathy, but for the uh, diabetic neuropathy, I'm not sure. And other question, is there any specific, uh, I mean, better option for patient with cardiac issue or patient with CKD? Uh, you know, uh, for pregabalin and gopantin, because uh, the curance is 100% uh, kidney through the, the uh, renal uh, curance, therefore, uh, for the patient with CKD, usually you should have a consultation with the uh, uh, kidney doctor or uh, nephrologist, because uh, if you prescribe, for example, pregabalin in a patient with uh, kidney failure or renal failure, uh, it may uh, increase uh, the risk of, you may increase the risk of drowsiness because uh, the, the medication is not metabolized properly. But, uh, and the better option is uh, TCA or amitriptyline because for amitriptyline or for venlafaxine, SNRIs, uh, they have 100% metabolism of, uh, with, with uh, liver or that's a hepatic metabolism. Therefore, in some 
for patient, patients with kidney failure or renal failure. Uh, Theoretically, antidepressants are uh, preferred, but for, uh, for the patients with liver failure, usually pregabalin and gabapentin are preferred. Excellent, uh, Dr. Farzad. Any final message you would like to pass to the, our audience who are still with us until this time? Uh, there is a question regarding the role of anti-epileptic. Uh, as you know, both pregabalin and gabapentin are anti-epileptic. And uh, mm -hmm. sometimes we use it to control, for example, focal seizure. And the first uh, role of this medication uh, were, uh, the, was to control epilepsy. But after that, uh, we usually use it for neuropathy. Uh, for other anti-epileptic medications, we can use also carmazepine. But uh, the main con concern for carbamazepine is that uh, it decreases the serum level of other medications. As you know, the patient with diabetes uses, for, the, the use, for example, the medication for heart, for hypertension, and there, or maybe warfarin or because of atrial fibrillation mm -hmm. or heart failure. Therefore, it reduces the, uh, the serum level of this medication because of the interactions. Therefore, it's not a good option for patients with diabetes or diabetic neuropathy. Excellent, excellent, Dr. Thank you very much. I think for your uh, this comprehensive review and answering all the questions, I think we have covered all the questions stated there. And we would like uh, to thank you very much for being with us uh, this night. And also would like to thank our participant. And uh, the, the video is recording. It will be there in uh, YouTube channel for the Oman Diabetic Association. And uh, keep tuned to our social media and uh, see you in La Save uh, 14. So thank you very much, Dr. Farzad. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank so you. Day one. Shukran Gazeera. Subhanallah.